in the epistle of St. Paul that we read this morning, he talks about obstacles, obstacles to being a Christian. And the obstacles he mentions are pretty significant. Hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watching, and hunger. I cannot imagine walking out of the house in the morning as a Christian wondering if I'm going to be beaten on the way to work. Wondering if I'm going to make it home alive. The biggest worry when you leave the house in the morning is how many people are on the road. And that's just a minor inconvenience. But not really a threat to personal safety. It's kind of crazy. These are the, these are the obstacles in the early church. I mean, there was a real threat if you were a Christian and anyone found out about it. That you might not make it home. That you might not be able to have a, a successful job or raise a family. There was a threat to your very life if you were a Christian in the first couple hundred years of Christianity. That's why it's kind of crazy today, in the 21st century, when we complain, oh, the service is too long. Oh, I have to stand a long time. Oh, why did you do a shorter sermon? You don't complain about that every day. Because in the early church, you would risk life and limb just to go to worship. There are many other obstacles less lethal in the world today, but there are obstacles nonetheless. And one of those obstacles is distraction. Distraction. We have so many other things going on, so many possibilities. If, you didn't have, if we didn't have electricity, it would limit your options of what to do this afternoon. You'd probably have to go home and hang out with your family, like actually talk to them. But because we have like electronics, one can go in this room and watch TV, and someone can go in this room and watch TV. And if you run out of TVs, somebody will probably have an iPad or some other electronic device that can arrange to keep you all separate. That is a distraction. And of course, we have sports, we have activities, we have all kinds of things to choose from. And perhaps the biggest distraction is our phones. How many people this last week found that they had an extra spare minute or two? had a spare minute or two where they had nothing to do. Anyone have a spare minute or two where they had absolutely nothing to do? I mean, let's be honest. How many people did not have one spare minute? One sp who think they had not one spare minute? Not one person here, the, the people who had not one spare minute, you mean you didn't have one time where you sort of idly looked at the phone? Not one time this week? All right, those who had the, the few spare minutes, did you spend those few spare minutes looking at the phone or doing something else? How many spent a few extra minutes looking at the phone? All right. If there was a choice between like looking at the phone and calling someone you hadn't talked to for a while, how many people do you think would opt for the phone? How many people are more likely to opt for the phone? All right. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands here, but I'm sure that when the, uh, many people opt for the phone, they don't opt for, you know, I've got two or three extra minutes of nothing to do. I think I'll get on my knees and pray for somebody. That, that seems almost like a ridiculous idea. Because we just go to the phone. We have an extra second, we look at the phone. I'm so wired to the phone, I'm looking at the phone when I'm brushing my teeth in the morning. I mean, I looked at the daily readings, I checked the ESPN scores for yesterday, I brushed my teeth. It's like part of what we're doing. That's the biggest obstacle today. And the other thing that's an obstacle is that there's pressure, I think, to not be a Christian. I think there's pressure to not be a Christian. Maybe no one's making fun of you for being a Christian, but people kind of roll their eyes like, you mean you're going to skip the ball game and go to church? You're taking off for a holiday because it's a religious holiday? I'm sure there's a little, I know, not I'm sure, I know there's a little bit of pressure there. Another obstacle to our faith is that we lack knowledge. Knowledge is power. When you have no knowledge, it has no power, no relevance for you. And so it's hard to maintain a discipline of, discipline of prayer or worship if we don't quite understand what we're doing when we're praying or worshiping. Now, St. Paul told us, in addition to naming some obstacles, he named some tools we can use to overcome the obstacles that he's writing about. So we can overcome these things with purity, knowledge, forbearance, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. These are tools to overcome the obstacles that we face in life, back then and now. 
So I want to give you two things to think about, two very specific things to think about today, to take away from today. One relates to prayer and the other one relates to worship. I had this discussion a couple weeks ago in the Bible study group about whether to pray out loud or pray in your head. And we're talking about when we're praying alone, not when we're with people, but praying alone. So you're alone in your car or you're alone in your room and you decide to pray. Do you pray out loud or do you pray in your mind? Now, part of the problem when we pray in our mind is that there are lots of things that go into our mind. So while I'm thinking of the Lord and the people I need to pray for, I'm thinking about the tasks I need to do today, the people I need to call, and then all of a sudden my mind becomes like a jumbled mess. Now, we only have so much mental energy in our life, so when we're talking, like I'm talking now, there's less room in your head for other things to get in there. While giving a sermon, I am not likely to have as many other thoughts competing for my brain space because part of my brain is working my mouth. When I come and I pray here, and I pray silently, I do have a challenge with other thoughts going in my head. I also will go way too fast. When I come here and I take a list of people and I want to pray for all those people, if I just eyeball the list, I'm going to go so fast, I'm not going to remember saying the names of the people on the list. So one of the things that someone told me one time that is very helpful in prayer is that you should pray out loud and pray slow enough that if someone was standing next to you listening to your prayer, they would understand what you are saying. They would understand what you are saying. Right? So if I am praying for names, I'm like, Maria, George, Eleni, Posadina, Postadinos, John, John, Michael, and you're like, well, what are you saying? Then I'm probably praying too fast. But if you were there and you were like, oh, I understand, I hear a name. I may not know who that is, but I, I, I heard John and a Michael and a Lenny and Costadina. All right, that means you're, you're slowing down enough. So one helpful thing when you're praying, pray out loud and pray slow enough that if someone was there next to you, they would understand what you were praying about. I try to offer the prayers in the altar, the, the silent prayers, so that the altar boys around can hear them and can understand them. The second thing I want to offer as a takeaway has to do with the Divine Liturgy. Now, we start the Divine Liturgy at 10 o'clock every Sunday. And some people come religiously at 10 o'clock. And some people come religiously at 11 o'clock. Some people come religiously at 10.45. We pretty much get here at the same time every Sunday. It's just a question of are you an early comer, an on-time comer, or a late comer, or a very late comer. So one of the things that happens at the very beginning of the Divine Liturgy is something called the Great Litany. It's a litany of 12 petitions. The priest says, In peace let us pray to the Lord, for the peace from above and the salvation of our souls, for this holy house, for our country, for those who are sick, those who are suffering. And this great litany actually encompasses everything you could probably think of in the world in a set of 12 petitions. A set of 12 petitions. Because the last of the petition says, for, those, for every kind of deliverance from affliction, wrath, and necessity, any kind of need, so if we haven't actually said the need, the specific need, that's sort of the catch-all catch petition. So one of the things that I, that I find helpful when I'm praying the Great Litany, of course, we pray that all the time. And people are like, oh, Father, it's the same and the same and the same. Why do I have to get there at 10 o'clock to hear the same all the time? I have in my head like a slideshow going on. So when I pray for our country, the president and all those in civil authority and public service, there's multiple things that can get into my slideshow. I might see a, a picture of the president. I might see a picture of a guy in a tank in Iraq. I may see a picture of a family in Texas waiting for their loved one to come home. I may see a, a fire engine ra racing to an accident or a police officer hoping to make it home alive. So every time I do the liturgy, a different slide comes into my head. And I may have 100 liturgies, I may have 100 different slides for that particular petition. There's a petition that says, for those who travel by land, sea, and air, those who are sick or suffering or, or in captivity and for their salvation. And if I ask everyone in the church, what comes to your mind when you hear that petition? There are 200 people here. There will probably be 200 different answers. Because we all know different people who are suffering or different people who are traveling or different people who are in some kind of need. Now imagine if we all had a mental bubble that you could all read. Like the, like the show that was on about dating and then they had like a little cloud up there and they said like, I wish this date was over, but out of your mouth, they're like, you're wonderful. All right, now if we had a mental bubble, hopefully it wouldn't see, it'd probably be saying like, where is he going with the sermon? I want to leave. All right, but imagine if early in the service you heard a petition 
for our country, for those who are sick or suffering, and everyone was really cued into what we were doing. And you could see the mental bubble of my neighbor has cancer, my husband's going on a long trip, we are suffering financially, so-and-so just went to the military, so-and-so's wondering if their son will come back in college still a Christian. And imagine you could see all those mental bubbles, two or three hundred of them, all above the people. You know how powerful that would be? To, th to think just in, the, in getting here and a priest saying a petition and, and acquired all the same Lord have mercy that would bring 200 different thoughts of people to lift up in prayer times 12 petitions that could be 2400 thoughts hovering above us going up to heaven that is a very very powerful image so when we're coming to church we shouldn't just be coming here to like look at our watches or follow the book we should be coming here to work we should be coming here and having a slideshow of what's going on and lifting that up and imagine again all the people around you are lifting up something and you have a mental bubble of hundreds and hundreds and thousands of thoughts all going up to heaven to our God, passing through the saints and the angels on the way there. That's what we're doing when we're worshiping. That's why it's so important. That's why we need the choir to lead us. That's why we need you to come on time so that we can offer these things in a moving, organic way throughout the course, throughout the journey of the Divine Liturgy. So next Sunday, come and have a slideshow going through your head of things to remember as we're praying. And this week, when you're praying, pray slow enough. You don't have to, God doesn't care about the quantity of words. There's no prize to get the most words out of your mouth. But say, offer a prayer in a sincere way that's slow enough mentally that if someone else was there next to you, they'd comprehend what you're doing. If we are more intentional in prayer and more intentional in the liturgy, we can remove obstacles of boredom and inertia and complex thoughts going through our head. These tools that St. Paul wrote about are present in the prayer and worship. When we're praying in an in a intentional, purposeful way, the Holy Spirit is there, the power of God is there, and after we're done praying, we are probably likely to, to go away with more kindness and genuine love because we've spent time in prayer and in worship God. And when we do that, we heighten prayer and worship, our, our kindness follows. It's, it's virtually impossible to have an, an encounter with God in prayer and then go out and act like a jerk in the next moment. It slows us down and just allows us to act with more kindness. So thank you for listening to what I said today. I hope that you have a prayerful week. I look forward to gathering next Sunday for an intentional and more purposeful divine liturgy. And I hope that you have a wonderful, blessed, healthy, and prayerful, and kind week. All of you. Thank you for being here, part of our congregation. Thank you again to our choir for singing so beautifully this morning.